Hello there. Welcome to the practice of spirituality. For thousands of years, it was thought that to get to the spiritual level of reality, the hallmark of which is the soul, you had to separate yourself from your body, separate yourself from emotion, and separate yourself from the mind. Little did we know that the truth was right there under our noses. The truth is, there is no such thing as something that is not spiritual. Spirit, or soul, manifests itself as thoughts, it manifests itself as emotions, and it manifests itself as a body. Therefore, by getting more in touch with your emotions, more in touch with your thoughts, and more in touch with your body, we penetrate the spiritual aspect of this universe deeper. The emotions, the thoughts, and the physical structure must be integrated in order for us to progress spiritually in our lives. But how many people have told you that in order to reach enlightenment or in order to feel good, you have to separate from these aspects of yourself? The answer is way too many. And the aspect of embodiment that most of them seem to be the most concerned with separating from is the mind. Many of us have taken spiritual bypassing to a whole new level. Not only are we trying to bypass negative thoughts, we are trying to bypass our mind entirely. It is a spiritual truth that you are not your mind, you are not your emotions, and you are not your body. And yet you are your mind, you are your emotions, and you are your body. These things are not antagonists. They are not enemies. It's not like your mind is an antagonist that is sent down here deliberately to prevent you from enlightenment. In fact, your mind wants enlightenment and wants to feel good just as much as you do. It just doesn't know how to go about doing that. Just like a child, the mind is deeply knowing in some ways, and naive in other ways. Ask a three-year-old to help you clean up a mess. Chances are, as good as the child's intentions are, they're going to smear a stain deeper into the carpet. They don't know how to clean up the mess yet. Your mind is like that. Often the thing that it thinks is helping you is actually hurting you. Your mind has learned how to operate from your parents. It only knows what works and what doesn't work because of observing them. This means if you had a parent that thought, even on a subconscious level, that worrying worked, your mind learned that worrying worked. The problem on this planet, of course, is the fact that people can procreate regardless of what level of consciousness that they hold. So a person can be completely unconscious, or have a lot of mental processes that don't work, and still have children that they pass those processes on to. How many times have you heard statements like these? Calm your mind. Your mind is like a monkey or a wild horse. It's your job to tame it. Don't listen to your mind. Don't believe your mind. The mind is Mara. Your mind makes you lose touch with the present moment. Don't let it. Thoughts will only lead you in circles. Your thoughts are not your own. Your mind is your instrument. Learn to be its master and not its slave. The biggest obstacles in our lives are the barriers that our mind creates. Etc. Basically, there's a feeling among people that trickles out into spiritual teachings that the mind is somehow against us and against our progression and is deliberately hurting us. This belief causes us to treat our mind like the enemy. We develop extreme resistance to our own minds. This is torture because we cannot escape from our mind. It's like living with an enemy inside our own skin. We resist the mind to our own peril because instead of becoming whole, we split ourselves apart and try to separate from that part of ourselves. We need to be very conscious of what causes us to have resistance to our own mind and gravitate towards practice that facilitates an embracing kind of harmonious union with our mind rather than a separation or divorce from our mind. Your mind is not your enemy, and your mind was created for a very important reason. Your mind, in fact, molds the energy of this universe into shape, substance, and form. It takes what is potential energy and makes it into tangible reality. Your mind is like a sculptor or an artist that is creating the world that you live in. It creates the world you perceive and also the faculties to perceive. The mind holds much of the responsibility for the creation of the you that you call by your name. Everything you love in this life is a manifested thought, therefore everything you love about this life owes itself to mind. I think it is sad that collectively as a species we can only relate to something needing to be nurtured as long as that thing is a child. We can't conceptualize of the idea of an adult needing to be nurtured. However, I'm going to stick with our current consensus. And I'm going to give you an analogy. I've spoken multiple times on the fact that your emotions are like the child within you. 
They need to be nurtured and valued and held and embraced and appreciated. But your mind is like a child as well. It needs those same things just as badly. The mind would not speak if it did not think it had something important to share with you. It wants you to hear it. Instead of separating yourself from your mind, embrace your mind. It is self-loving and it is the opposite of self-abandonment. Especially when your mind is causing you to feel pain. When your mind is doing something that causes you pain, like worrying or focusing on painful beliefs, this is the mind hurting. Do what you would do with a child that is hurting. You can embrace your mind and bring your mind back into alignment through a four-step process. I'm going to outline that process for you now. Step one, become aware of what you are thinking or paying attention to. Notice and name what it is that the mind is doing. Let's call this step recognition. Two, care compassionately about what you are thinking and what your mind is doing by seeing it as valid and important. Do not judge the thoughts you are thinking as right or wrong to be thinking. Seek to understand your own thoughts instead of to agree or disagree with them. Three, acknowledge and validate your thoughts. To acknowledge and validate your thoughts, you do not need to validate that the thoughts you have are correct. Instead, you need to let your mind know that it is an okay thing and a valid thing to have those thoughts. It is understandable why you would have those thoughts. For example, if your mind starts thinking of worst case scenarios, you do not validate those thoughts by saying to your mind, you're right, those things are definitely going to happen. You could validate your mind instead by saying, I see that you are worrying. I can totally understand why you are thinking about the worst case scenario because you want to be prepared. Four, after and only after your thoughts have been recognized and acknowledged and validated, help the mind in a loving way to focus on something that feels better to focus on. This is the point at which it is appropriate to use any techniques designed to steer thought, change thought, or stop thought. I like to teach people during this particular step before they progress forward to imagine their mind either inside their head, just around their head, or somewhere else. Whatever you define as mind. And I want you to imagine enfolding the mind in a loving and embracing, warm, compassionate type of energy in whatever color that you choose. This works especially good for people who worry or who feel like they are the victim of chronic negative thought. We need to acknowledge the mind as valid and loved before it will be ready to move with us up the vibrational scale into a better feeling thought. You are not here to fix your mind any more than you're here to fix a child. You are here to love and guide your mind. And you are here to love and guide your mind in the direction of something which facilitates your progression and your happiness and your purpose here on earth. Once you have compassionately acknowledged and validated your thoughts as valid to think and you are feeling like the mind would appreciate being helped into alignment, there are many techniques we could use. The first is to question the thoughts you are thinking. This is not the same as invalidating your thoughts. It is showing you that you do not have to be afraid of what you think. It is helping you to stop being constricted by the pain of the idea of truth. My favorite process for questioning thoughts, hands down, is Byron Katie's process called The Work. So if you're interested in questioning your thoughts, I highly suggest looking up her products and doing that process. Meditation is a technique that works for stopping thought or for directing thought in a direction that is more beneficial to you. If you don't like solo meditations, you can always follow along with guided meditations. You could sit down and deliberately change your beliefs. For anyone who's interested in doing this, I actually made a video a while ago on YouTube titled How to Change a Belief. So you can refer to that video to find out how to do that. You could use your mind like a tool to move up the vibrational scale by finding the better feeling thought and the better feeling thought. For example, if you find that you're sick and that's causing you to spiral in a negative direction, you could deliberately use your mind to focus on things about being sick that cause you to feel better about being sick. You could take out your positive aspects journal. Now when your mind is spiraling, the idea of positive focus is irritating. Even the word positive makes your skin sort of crawl. So rather than think of this as a positive focus journal, think of it as a paying attention to something that feels better journal. So you could take this journal out and you could write positive aspects about something that's causing you pain, or else you could just write down positive aspects about the day you're having, or whatever you're doing, or the room that you're sitting in. 
You could also do a feel-good scavenger hunt. This is one of my favorite techniques for getting your mind on board with your progression, with feeling good. To do a positive scavenger hunt or a feel-good scavenger hunt, you pretend that you are just like a young child who's seeking out Easter eggs. But instead of seeking out Easter eggs, you're looking for things that feel good to look at. So if I'm driving in the car, for example, I might think about the fact that I like the way that the reflection is bouncing off of the car in front of me. I might look over and see a couple of trees that I find beautiful and take note of that. I might like the way the steering wheel feels in my hand. Basically what I'm doing is looking for things in my environment deliberately that feel good instead of waiting for them to come to my notice, which we all know when we're in a negative state won't happen. There are so many techniques designed to get your mind to work with you instead of against you. I could never list them all. The point of this process, though, is not to deal with the mind as if it is an unwanted burden or an antagonist that is getting in your way. It is to, in fact, give the mind something else to work with, something that feels better to work with. I want you to begin to think of your mind as the sculptor of your life. But the only energy it has to work with is the energy that you give it, in the same way that the only energy your body has to work with is the food that you give it. Focusing on things that feel good to focus on, like beautiful things, or things to appreciate, or words of affirmation, is like giving a sculptor pristine, warm clay to work with. Focusing on things that feel painful to focus on, like horror films, or things to criticize, or painful words, is like giving a sculptor molded and cold clay to work with. Obviously, what that sculptor would create would be much different than a sculptor who was given pristine warm clay to work with and mold. This is super important when we consider that this sculptor is molding your life. Now that we've covered that, there's an idea in the spiritual field that in order to reach the present moment, you have to disconnect from the mind. The goal when it comes to reaching the present moment is not to become disconnected or fractured from ourselves so as to get there. The goal is to have all of us join ourselves in the present moment, including our mind. The mind will not enter the present moment because it is afraid of the present moment. Why is it afraid of the present moment? Because it has experienced hurt in the present moment before. If you do what is needed to help the mind or to let the mind become less afraid of the present moment, the mind will naturally enter the present moment with the rest of you. Trying to force it to be present is like throwing a frightened child into deep water. In tandem with that, there's also an idea in the spiritual field that it is possible to calm your mind. How many times have you heard that? Calm your mind, they say, as if it's possible. It's not possible to force your mind to do anything. All you can do is offer your mind things like love and offer it things like different stuff to focus on or different thoughts to think, which allows the mind to come into a state which just so happens to be calm. But for the sake of all of our expansion, let's ask ourselves this question now. What is so wrong about a mind that is not calm? What if I was to tell you that the mind's most natural state of being is not actually the state of calm? That the state of calm is only one state of mind, of many, most of which are forward-moving instead of receptive like the state of calm is. And the calm state of mind is no more or less valuable than any other state of mind. Ask yourself this question. What was the purpose of mind when it was first created? And ask yourself this question. If the mind had an important and beneficial role to play in life itself, what role would the mind play? Calm, by definition, means nearly or completely motionless. But the mind is the artist. It is no more natural for the mind to be always calm than it is for the artist to be always motionless. Motion and lack of motion both play an important role in the perceiving or conceiving and expressing of art. Energy movement is the medium of the mind. When the mind is calm, the mind is in a state of perception and has allowed other aspects of you to lead, like the heart. This is not a bad thing. It's a great thing. When the mind is calm, you can perceive your eternal essence. When the mind is calm, you can enjoy all the benefits of motionlessness. Movement and non-movement both have a place in this universe. They both play a very spiritual role, the keys being able to consciously decide when to be motionless and when to embrace movement. We need to stop worrying about the mind being calm. We only worry about the mind being calm when the mind being in a state of agitation prevents us from perceiving. We only worry about the mind being calm 
when the mind seems agitated with negative thoughts that it is thinking. But that has more to do with the fact that the mind is molding negative things that it's focusing on than positive things. We can give this molder or this sculptor different clay to use, and then it won't matter to us really whether our mind is calm or whether it is in a state of fast-paced motion. Everyone's mind is like a little different artist. For the sake of your understanding what I mean, I'll explain it this way. I like to compare people's minds to different dog breeds. For example, one person might have a mind like a Springer Spaniel. It has lots of energy and is happiest when it has an outlet of expression. It is happiest with movement. One person might have a mind like a pug. It is playful, but it has an easy time settling down. One person might have a mind like a golden retriever. It is only active when it has a project to do. The rest of the time, it allows the heart to lead. You get what I mean. And to realize enlightenment, you do not have to have a mind like a golden retriever. We have to stop treating our minds like they're all the same and trying to get our minds to be all the same. Instead, we need to figure out what suits our type of mind specifically, what tools help our mind specifically, to find alignment with what we want our mind to help us with. What that means is, if somebody has a mind like a Springer Spaniel, and they're the happiest with movement, but they want their mind to be in a state of calm, then it might be best for them to do a moving meditation, something like Tai Chi, so their mind has a movement or something to focus on, which allows their mind to step out of the way of their heart, and their heart to lead the way. If we have what we consider to be a hyperactive mind, we should never try to force our mind to be calm. Instead, we need to give our mind what it needs so that it can come to a resting state. And trust your mind to let you know what it needs. Have you ever considered asking it? Next time you feel like you want to be calm, or you want something from your mind, and it seems like it's pulling in the opposite direction, ask your mind, what do you need in order to be calm or fill in the blank? I was doing this practice with one of my clients. And when he asked his mind that question, what do you need? His mind said to run. So he let it run. Almost like letting the reins out on a horse or the leash out on a dog. It went crazy. It ran all over the place. It bounced around. And he watched that movement with appreciation, with a sort of loving amusement. And what he noticed is that soon, that jumping around and that running calmed down. And only then was he able to sink into a state of calmness. In fact, he achieved a deep state of meditation on that day that he'd been trying to achieve for the last five years. It is time that we stop making an enemy of our mind in our spiritual practice. We cannot become whole and we are not living in accordance with oneness when we try to get away from the mind to become spiritual. Integration needs to happen on the level of mind as well as every other level of ourselves. And we can't do that if we're trying to distance ourselves from our mind or disidentify with our mind. See and treat your mind like an ally. Find ways that you can include it in your spiritual practice and use it to benefit your spiritual progression. Work with your mind instead of against your mind. Because the truth is, even though the mind might have hurt you unintentionally, the mind has been trying to work with you instead of against you all along. Have a good week. Music